Hello and welcome to Convergences, a political theory show from Zero Books at the intersection of emancipation and critical imagination. My name is Will and I'm joined by my good friend Adam from Acid Horizon. Today we're talking with Tom Wyman about his new edition or abridgment of the German ideology by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, published by Repeater Books. The creative abridgment attempts to re-energise the text as an introduction to Marx and Marxism, but also provide a necessary rereading from those of us that have read this text and reread it, along with many others of Marx's works many times before. In this edition, Marx and Engels appear to provide an account of philosophy as helping us confront the contradictions in the present in a manner evocative of a kind of philosophical therapy. Tom Wyman is a writer and philosopher who has published essays on the Frankfurt School, Kierkegaard, Walter Benjamin and German idealism. And he is the author of Infinitely Full of Hope, published by Repeater Books, which interrogates the conditions of hope given the continued defeats of the past and the likely catastrophes of the future, which in some senses amounts to fatherhood in the present. So thanks so much to you, Tom, for joining us. It's really great to have you on. So I thought we'd start by just sort of asking, you know, what was it about specifically the German ideology that seemed to require this kind of this new treatment, this new abridgment? And, you know, why this text? Why this abridgment, really? Well, yeah, I mean, I suppose, has anyone ever tried to read the German ideology unabridged? You know, it just cries out for it. So, you know, you read this thing, right? You kind of sit down, you kind of, you're trying to study Marx, and, you know, you hear about the German ideology, and you could get an abridgment, you know, from C.J. Arthur, you know, and, and it was just this chapter which is meant to be on Feuerbach, and then Feuerbach is barely mentioned. And you're thinking, what's going on with that? I mean, you dig into it a bit more and you realise there's like loads of the German ideology, but it's, you read it, it's mostly about Max Stirner and it, it doesn't really make any sense. And, and when you read the thing about Max Stirner, it's like 400 pages of just like these sort of weird in-jokes about Don Quixote and it's like, and this guy called like Schelling, it's like, what, what's going on? Like, what, what's happening here? Is this actually an important text? What's going on? What's a big lesson? And so I wanted to figure out, is there something actually really going on that's important, you know, when I actually ploughed through and read the whole thing several years ago, and and it, there is lots of really important stuff in it, and about, like, how Marx and Engels conceive of communism and the kind of political, their assumptions they're making about the political subject, about how it's going to get there. But people haven't grasped this or realised it because it's hidden away in this set of, you know, barely comprehensible notes. And then I did more research around it, and it turns out, like, there's a whole bunch of scholars nowadays who want to say the German ideology doesn't even exist. It's not even like a kind of text that like, exists on any level. It's just compiled by editors. And like the, the ostensible chapter of Feuerbach is one of the most beautiful pieces of philosophy I've ever read in my life. So I'm thinking, you know, I don't want to get rid of this, right? So there's two reasons now to kind of compile a new abridgment to say, you know, this ostensible chapter on Feuerbach, it's nothing to fucking whatever to do with Feuerbach, but it's something really important and the material on Sterner is interesting and it's got some really good bits when you shave off the nonsense. And both of those two two things, to preserve both of those two things, you need to take a slightly disrespectful attitude towards the text and towards Marx and Marx scholarship. And the perfect venue to do that was in repeated books where you can do something like this and people don't go, yeah, but what's the scholarly basis for it? And you have to go like, it's just vibes, just scholarly vibes. So yeah, so that was why I wanted to do it. So I did it. I mean, it's it is a kind of edition which plays very it's fast and loose with the original material, but in the best ways possible because it's getting at the actual philosophical bedrock underneath it. It's not going through, as you said, yeah. the, the section on Sterner, the biggest one, is a paragraph by paragraph commentary, which I, I understand some of the in jokes, but unless you was in the back of a Berlin wine bar, Hippel's Weinstube around eighteen forty three or in a private classroom with Carl Verde in 1841, you ain't going to get shit about what they're talking about. Because it's all in-jokes. All of these young Hegelian arguments are happening more or less within one pub or within yeah. uh, one magazine. So, yeah, Marx never met Sterner, but Engels did. So is that, of course, a great joke that Engels was, <laughs> Engels was Sterner. And, the, and the, of course, the, they both wrote together in, in the Neuranisch Zeitung. But, I mean, this text has quite a history of its own in terms of the, I guess, the the, the name of this text in a similar way to something like the will to power or Paul's letter to the Hebrews as you remark on. So when does this 
So the text that most people will see in their you know, introduction to Marx courses on the German ideology, how did that get there? Because of course you have, it comes out, you have the Soviet era, right? Yeah, so it was kind of, so, I mean, I, I, the, as far as I understand it, and bear in mind it is late today, and I've just, I'm on holiday, and I'm looking after my children all day. As far as I understand it, roughly speaking, it's for, so Marx and Engels, in the 1840s, set out to write yet more shit posting mm. about young Hegelians they didn't like. Following up the massive success of The Holy Family, one of the most famously readable texts in the history of philosophy, they decided, let's do it. That was so good. Let's do it again. But let's do it now for people who have more important things to say, like Feuerbach and Stirner. And also Bruno Bauer, again, for some reason. And then also there's a bit about true socialists. So they, they wanted to kind of settle their well, various intellectual scores with the Hegelian tradition. And later on, at any rate, Marx reports that as being a vital kind of prolegomena to, you know, moving beyond philosophy and, and working on his sort of economics. This text was never published. It, it apparently had a contract to publish it, but I can't imagine... I mean, I imagine publishing was different back then, but nowadays, I mean, if you send this thing to, you know, to a publisher, this chapter on Sterner, they just, you know, they wouldn't be happy about it. So so they said, you know, I think mean, Marx's famous quote about it is that they left it to the gnawing of the mice. But then, of course, Marx being the kind of very important thinker that he was, after he died, you know, people would, you know, obviously scour is a nat class for, for gems, and they found this these sort of notes for, and sort of other things that made, ostensibly made up this text called the German Ideology. And this was somewhat known about in the sort of, you know, 1910s, 1920s, but no one made any serious effort to publish it until a collection of editors from the Soviet Union, headed by David, who was shortly afterwards sent to the gulags. And... Nowadays, the general consensus, I believe, based on analysis of the manuscripts, analysis of what he did, people doing textual work for, I haven't done myself, so I can't like, confirm. Sounds, you know, it sounds right to me, but I, you know, whatever. I'm not that kind of scholar, so I don't know, but, but it sounds basically right. But Ryazanov realised there should have been a chapter on Feuerbach based on what Marx and Engels wrote about the text, there wasn't really one, so from various other notes, he compiled what seemed like a chapter in Feuerbach, which was actually a chapter in which Marx and Engels laid out a general theory of history and of sort of what communism would actually kind of be like and how freedom and freedom would play out in communist society and how the point of history is for the proletariat to abolish itself and so on and so forth, which I then also kind of tacked on to that a couple of little paragraphs which kind of mentioned Feuerbach. And this became that chapter that Razanov compiled ostensibly about Feuerbach kind of caught on and became a, you know, sort of, you know, Althusser has this famous paper about it in, in Four Marx, about Marxism and humanism. It became a kind of cornerstone for sort of humanist readings of Marxism in the middle of the 20th century, which Althusser the wife murdered Althusser wasn't uh, particularly into. And yeah, so he, and Althusser him, himself sort of believed that the text actually sort of demolished any kind of last vestiges of humanism in Marx. And so I've misquoted at least part of that history because actually it's the Paris manuscripts of the cornerstone for humanism, which was another set of notes that were discovered around the same time. But uh, anyway, Mal used the German ideology as, you know, the cornerstone for this kind of reading of, this anti-humanist reading of Marx. And then more recently, people have sort of challenged the textual history and blah, blah, blah. Is this covering, is this, is this all comprehensible? Is this all covering yeah. it all? Good, okay. Yes, let's move the philosophicals of the questions of humanism or history or yeah. materialism. I guess, sort of, just we, I just we build up to that. Let me give everyone like a crash course in young Hegelianism. So Hegel completes German idealism, gives us this lovely system. At the end of it, there's absolute spirit, there's God. Yeah. Bauer comes along, he's one of these fully paid up Hegelians. He's hired to take down this guy, David Strauss, who says, well, Hegel shows that Jesus doesn't really exist. It's all just logic of self-consciousness. Bauer, Bruno Bauer is you know, brought in to say, you need to go and essentially deduce the truth of the gospel via Hegel. 
Now, the problem is that actually made the dialectic, sorry, the, the scriptio depend on the dialectic, not the other way around. So he flips, says, okay, what we've got to start doing now is critiquing all of the religious fundamental presuppositions of the state because they're living in you know, Prussia, the Christian state of Prussia. And he starts this group, you know, the free ones. And, ba- and Feuerbach's here at the same time. His dad was famously torn a new one by Hegel in the philosophy of rights. And Feuerbach wants a bit of revenge at this point. He starts saying, okay, well, Hegel shows us that the core of religion is the essence of mankind. Similar thing to what Bauer was saying. So we need to have a revolution and bring, make it explicit that we are living for humans, humanity. We're going to have a humane state. We're going to do a revolution. We're going to make it all perfect for the human species and its perfect essence, which is we used to think was God, but now we know it's man. Sterner shows up and says, look, no, you're all wrong. You have, you've replaced one kind of domination for the other. It's all essentialism is spooky. It's all like you believe in ghost stories. We need to assert the raw presupposition of all of this, which is the individual that thinks it and has thoughts. Now, Marx is going to show up and say that, Sterner, you've kind of done the work with Feuerbach and Bauer for me, but this is all ultimately bollocks. You're all still doing the same thing, which is Hegel. You're all still in the realm of ideas. Marx says, you know, Mark Sterner canonizes all the philosophy, makes everything into a sacred idea just so we can rebel against it. And Marx is then going to say, this is typical of all Germans. The backwards German ideologues, they've all got it all backwards. They start with the ideas, they ignore the real presuppositions of all ideas, which is sensuous matter in motion. So, and this is sort of the, this is the response of Marx. So how does this response end up playing out? What is their response to all of these thinkers saying that you've got your presuppositions wrong, you've got it all asked backwards kind of thing? How does this play out? And what is you know, the overall thesis of that turns it from German idealism into a, I guess, post-German in the sense that they're in Belgium at this point, materialism? Well, I think you just stated quite succinctly why. I mean, you know, the Marx, you know, the German ideology text, as we have it, kicks off of this thought that, you know, there's all been all these wonderful, you know, things that have happened recently in Germany with these massive seismic revolutions and all of them have happened in the realm of pure thought. You know, that's just silly. Like, if when there is an actual... When there are actual revolutions, they happen in and between actual living people. They don't just happen because people change their minds about things. And, you know, the... I mean, partly what Marx is kind of responding to in the German ideology is a ba- sort of bad, ostensibly radical critique of Hegel, which just goes like, well, you know, Hegel sort of got his logic a bit wrong, so that means that actually the state works in a different way. Right, well, I mean, Hegel, for all the... I mean, in my view, in Marx's view, he is ultimately a kind of rationalist who kind of prioritises spirit over matter, at least figures out how those things are conjoined in a kind of roughly plausible way. So that, you know, what's actually going on in the world does actually track what Hegel says is the idea, right? Whereas Bauer in his ilk think, but if you change your ideas, you change the world. They're a bit like nowadays, if you sort of, people, if you raise awareness of things, well, then you can sort of change what's going on in, in between people in the world. But of course, that's ludicrous. It might be a kind of important, arguably, best reading about it's an important prolegomena to actual change. But the actual change is about how people live their lives in the everyday and the relations between them, which are actually going on between actually living people. And it's not just about what people think, it's about how they act and how they are and how they live. And Marx is saying that philosophy needs to be rooted in those things. And if it isn't, then it's bad philosophy. Well... Yeah, I'm kind of interested in this partially in relation to who the German ideology should be aimed at, right? Who should have their ground kind of shaken by Mm -hmm. German ideology in the sense which relates to the question of maybe we should be more basic, which is what ideology means. So, you know, we get this famous formulation, which is maybe the most famous formulation of ideology by Marx and Engels, which is that the ideas of the ruling class are in every the ruling ideas right yeah i was wondering perhaps could you say sort of sort of a little about a bit about you know what ideology means especially you know given people might know probably ideology through zizek before they know ideology through marx these days you know what's this concept of ideology what's marx and engels what have they got to say about it and who's the ruling ideas now you know who's the who is the germ who are the germans that we you know that we should be worried about or, and should be worried about this text 
Um, Queen. Well, I mean, in terms of defining ideology, no, I'm not your guy. I'm not going to give you a kind of definition. Right? I'm not. Just pluck it off the tree of read out of a dictionary. This is that's like I'm closer to being like an ordinary language philosopher. If you need to define it, just look at how you're using it in practice. But in terms of Marx and Engels, kind of in terms of who are the Germans, I mean, I think that the text is intended. I mean, it's a text that would have been intended to be read. I mean, by other radicals, ostensible radicals like them. I mean, probably in the first instance, it's aimed at them themselves, right? You know, Engels had a, this letter that he wrote to Marx, having just read Stirner's big book, where he goes, "Oh, this guy's great." You know, this guy's got almost other ideas. It's just he's not quite sort of doesn't quite realize that. All of this entails communism, but he's basically kind of right. And Marx seems to have sent him back a letter going like, no, Engels, you're wrong, you idiot, blah, blah, blah. Because in the next letter that Engels sent to him, he seems to be apologising for his previous views about Stirner. But we don't have the letter that Marx sent to Engels, so we don't know. But they seem to be kind of, they, they, wrote, they said they're purging themselves of their kind of erstwhile philosophical consciousnesses. And they kind of write as if they're trying to purge you know, other people in their circle of various sort of intellectual potentials that they have, they think that you could actually solve all these problems that you're interested in, that you're motivated by on the realm of pure, you know, just ideas, on the realm of pure spirit, right? And I think that's who the text is kind of most relevant to today. I mean, it's most relevant to people who are, you know, drawn to radical thought, but who ultimately just want to be sort of radical thinkers. I mean, I know both of you are at the CRMEP, and I think, I imagine, you know, I imagine might be quite a lot of people, because that fits the description of these days. And they're the kind of people who would, you know, end up spending their whole life in deference to kind of quite well-off, bougie professors just because they swagger around talking about ideology. You know, and I think Marx and Engels are trying to purge that instinct. And I think that's why I kind of pitched in the introduction. It's kind of like a sort of philosophical therapy. You know, they're telling you things that if you are a working class activist in a factory, you know, you're not, or wherever nowadays, you know, you're not, these are almost things you don't need to be reminded of a lot of it, right? Because this is just how you're living. This is how you're critiquing stuff. This is how you're acting. It's the philosophers who need this stuff in the German ideology. And that's why it's an important philosophical text is because it purges certain, in my view, certain bad philosophical instincts. Or it's meant to be a purgative of those. And again, maybe that's also another reason why I'm frustrated by some of the reception of the text, because it's like, you've got this text which tells you all these things and a lot of the recent reaction to it is like, well, maybe we could look more at the original documents and see. <laughs> well, like, maybe we could do some real close analysis of those original pieces of paper. <laughs> I mean, I've seen people try to do that based on whose handwriting yeah, is on it. Exactly. Um, yeah. It's like, we, yeah. What's irrelevant to this, right? Like, I mean, there is maybe uh, depends what you what questions you're asking, right? But mm. I, if any, in my view, you're not asking for the right questions of the text. If it, the questions you're asking can be solved by is this in Engels' handwriting or Marx's? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I think in terms of, I think, yeah, so it's, it's very good to think of this in terms of purging certain philosophical instincts. And yes, as you say in a footnote, a lot of philosophers, yeah, philosophers don't come out of this very well, but not in the ways I think a lot of people would expect from a critique by Marx and Engels. Because sometimes Marx and Engels' critique is always presented, especially in the later sort of writings, it's depicted more, it's not as, quite as cheeky. Marx and Engels are usually not as cheeky in their later works. They're more no. sort of men of science hitting with hard facts and logic kind of things. Whereas this text is, it's attacking the conservatism of philosophy in many yeah. ways, especially when it comes to, to to Bauer, who is who thinks that because he's flipped sides and has abandoned his ability to get a good teaching job by teaching, essentially, they do think there's a kind of radicality to teaching Hegel past 1844, because you know, the, the king shows up, says, points to Hegel's old roommate, Schelling and he says you need to excoriate the dragon seed of pantheism and even Engel shows up to Schelling's lectures to say I need to defend this man because if we defend Hegel we defend something revolutionary and I really am undermining my own job prospects here but who cares but but that's not revolutionary you itself that's job, what you're looking for a job in philosophy like how many are being advertised right now there's about two well, Patreon slash Asset Horizon podcast uh, yeah, yeah. comrades just anyone that's a better job that? prospect for the <laughs> But in terms of, I mean, let's I mean, let's get into the biggest part of this book, which is the critique of Sterner. Because Sterner is, mm. I mean, uh, pass on table, very interesting figure for me. I you know, 
committed to writing you know, a book on the fucker. But in terms of his, the main thing they want to critique here is his critique of communism, ultimately. Yeah. And I think this is what's best in terms of your abridgment of what you select, because Stern's critique of communism is very weird, because as they say, it's not very historical in terms of what the communist movement is. But in responding to Stern's critique of communism, Marx and Engels have radicalised their view of what communism is. So Stirner is somewhat anachronistically known as a as an anarchist. Bakunin was one of his classmates, as was Engels and Kierkegaard at one point, of course. And at one point, I remember reading a letter where they say, "Oh, Bakunin's been reading Stirner again. We can see this already ferment and already fermenting in Bakunin's thought." But the critique of Stirner's critique of communism is fascinating because it's Stirner's critique of communism is ultimately. A critique of Stalinism, as you say, it's essentially the essentialization of the worker. You know, the worker works to perfect them, the inner worker within themselves. They lift this moral standard of the worker, and essentially, that the universal species of workers, the idea of the worker, ends up benefiting in a way, at least in terms of how Stirner sees it, more than any particular worker as itself. This critique, whilst at the time quite null in light of certain historical developments, I mean has predicted stuff like, you know, it's the Konovite movement in the Soviet Union, for example. And there's, it's kind of it's kind of more of a valid point now, even though it wasn't a very good point then. But it's interesting how they respond to this critique of communism in terms of radical abolitionism. I was wondering in terms of, I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit, sort of where the real radicality comes from to critique of communism and how they sort of push through that with a more sort of revolutionary way of framing it. Yeah, I mean, so uh, so what's the question exactly? Who So who's more radical, Stirner or Marx? No, the question is essentially sort of how, what, how do they respond to Stirner's critique of communism such that communism becomes presented in sort of a, the most... Oh, well, yeah, well, I mean, Stirner's critique... So, I mean, as you say, Stirner's critique of communism is this... Stirner imagines that communism makes the state the universal capitalist, basically. And so it is, you know, a critique of of Stalin. He's anticipating Stalinism, basically, and going like, well, yeah, well, you just have a very strong state which owns everything and apportions resources in some ostensibly egalitarian fashion. And Stirner, you know, doesn't want to, you know, exist in such a society because who would, right? But, you know, and Stirner thinks, well, I mean, Stirner's whole deal is... But the only thing that's real is, you know, the ego, which is to the I. But he's not like an egoist in like a kind of Homo economicus kind of utility maximizing sense. He's an egoist in the sense that only I, in my total autonomous selfhood, can bestow value on anything. So, you know... I'm not, I, the true egoist is not someone who's out to get as much money and resources for themselves as possible, because that would be someone who's deciding those things are, are valuable based on what other people think about them. And the true egoist is someone who just sort of like, I mean, they're also not someone who can respond to their hedonistic desires, because their hedonistic desires, you know, Stirner still has this heritage of Kantianism in him, where you know, those hedonistic desires are not me either. So, you know, as Stirner says in the opening passages of his big book, you know, I've set my stall on nothing, right? We believe in nothing, Lebowski, as some other nihilist once says, you know, what is it to truly believe in nothing? What is to val- is to really value nothing and to kind of, what well, ostensibly the kind of ideal state for Stirner is just, is being, is no one can impose anything on you and you don't want anything and you don't have, you don't value anything unless you're absolutely certain you're only valuing it based on your like, total whim but also it can't just be coming from your like animal nature. It has to be, you know. So it's a wild, fascinating picture of sort of human psychology. But you can kind of see how Marx and Engels are responding to it with sort of like materialism as being the, you know, as, as being the kind of like a way of getting out of this almost cul-de-sac Sterner forces you into where you can't, you know, you, you, you kind of the only way you can be free is to want nothing whatsoever. Or by, you know, Marx and Engels kind of like ground, you know, the Sternerian egoist in our actual animal needs and desires and kind of show how over time these progress in certain ways and produce the kind of society that we have. And the point of if their idea about the kind of society post-revolution would be one in which we are actually kind of free in a way 
to behave like Sternerian egoists. It's just that we'd realise that our own individual interests are identical with the collective interest. And so that wouldn't be something that was being forced upon us by a kind of authority or by a third party. We'd sort of almost realise it spontaneously. And there's a kind of anticipation of that in the realisation of a working class consciousness. So they realise, well, we're free to rise up and overthrow the society as it exists because the bourgeoisie rely on us more than we rely on. And then in Marx and Engels' idea is that then that will mean... So rather than that meaning, you know, in the French Revolution, obviously you have a bourgeois revolution and the bourgeoisie sees the power of the state. You know, that would happen in the communist revolution. But then it wouldn't be the case that the working class would then be motivated to continue to hold power of the state for themselves a power of the state for themselves as a class. They would use that power to abolish themselves as a class by abolishing the economic system which has created them and in so doing ostensibly create an egalitarian society where we can be free to all realise our human interest, basically. And that's where humanism comes into the story. But it's part of materialism, you know, we're getting our needs, our desires, our wants, you know, from our sort of animal nature just you know, it's not like we're being forced by our animal nature to, to want and think want certain things. It's just we, that is what we are. There's a Feuerbachian element to that too. That's kind of basically how Feuerbach conceives of mankind and you know, humans or species being. All of that's still in the German ideology. Althusser's wrong about the German ideology. It's all from 1844 onwards, and Marx still believes all that stuff. So you know, that's the basic story, right? Marx and Engels in the German ideology are adopting lots of Stern's way of, of understanding how we could be autonomous but anchoring that in a materialist story that's kind of taken from Feuerbach. Absolutely. And it's particularly thinking about the question of abolition here, because, I mean, there are, you know, Stern is a rebel without a cause, you know, because he has set his cause on nothing. It's, you know, Marx and Engels are rebels with a cause here, because it's, what what aren't they abolishing in this text? Mm. Start saying, we're going to abolish civil law, and we're going to abolish all law. We're going to abolish the rights of man. Not to say abolish the human as such, but you know, this is where the generic element comes in. The, the, to abolishing the family at one point, very, very mm-hmm. spicy, very good. Uh, a lot, very a lot good. Of this is like a great podcast transcript. And just to summarize, and this is another good reason why you should buy this edition of the German ideology rather than any of the clinical, you know, critical level. Of, I mean, you know, Soviet editions is the footnotes because the summaries are fantastic. Because I mean, so this is a footnote twenty-two, page fifty-three, the summarizing the critique of Stirner, which has been done in about seven hundred pages, essentially. If class consciousness is to mean anything at all, then egoism and class consciousness must coincide. And this is why, I mean, one just a great summary, but also we can finally end this 200 year old beef between <laughs> sort of anarchos and anarcho Sternarians yeah. and Marxists. And yeah, reading like, read, read the German on, ideology, it's confusing to me if this ever became an issue because in the German ideology, Marx and Engels are basically just anarchists. They just have a, a, a particular story about how we reach the ideal anarchist right. utopia. I mean, Ryazanov must have, I mean, this must have played a part in why Ryazanov was shot, to be oh, honest, because the person yeah, yeah. who comes out of this book the worst is Stalin, maybe a little bit Lenin, depending on how you read it. Stirner, from a left perspective, comes out emboldened if you just historicize his own method, whereas, I mean, the 20th century is the real loser of the German ideology. <laughs> no, in, yeah, in yeah, ideology. like, and you can kind of see why... This text was taken up by people who were kind of critical of the Soviet Union in the 20th century, because like what Marx and Engels are describing here is highly antithetical to Marxism Leninism. You know, not just for stuff about Stir- their, you know, their, their critique of Stern's critique of communism, but also their understanding about how communism is going to be brought about, right? This is is it is not something that can be brought about by a vanguard party. This has to be brought about by the working class. As a whole, it can't it can't be brought it can't be brought about in the way that it was brought about in the Soviet Union. In part, like, you know, because again, you know, the kind of Leninist way of seeing how revolution might play out just can't work it because the point of revolution isn't to valorize the working class; it's to abolish the working class. We, you heard it here first, folks. Zero books. We are radicalizing the revolution. We're not doing this humanist spiked online bullshit anymore. We are finally... Oh, okay, I have to cut that out. Start beef. But, Will, sorry. Before I get on an anti-Doug Lane... No, I was just, okay, I, I, I have a, a question, which is... What's interesting about everything that you've just said in relation... Is because you get kind of glimpses, right? Marx always does this thing where he just gives you a glimpse of 
something that will sound like communism. So you get the fish in the morning, the hunt in the evening, lecture or whatever yeah. in, the, in the afternoon kind of thing. And then you get that bit in Capital, right, where he says, imagine, you know, a free community of people after Robinson Crusoe. Well, I'm interested in that. And then what you say is the most important line in the whole thing, which I agree, which is communism is the real movement which abolishes the present state of things. And I, I don't know how to figure out those two, how those two things relate, right? You know, there's a kind of negativity, right? You know, if you're talking like Adorno to the real movement that abolishes the present state of things, all you know is that it gets rid of everything else. But then he'll sort of tell you this stuff about what it might also be like. And I was wondering, you know, in relation to kind of how we're meant to see revolutionary movements, emancipatory movements kind of today, and, you know, in contrast to those of the 20th century, what, what you know, what's what's those two visions of visions, whatever, of communism, those two characterizations of doing of communism doing in these texts, like, you know, how are they helpful? Because I've struggled to think about the two. I mean, I don't, I suppose, you know, I, maybe one could see those two lines as contradictory. I don't necessarily see them as contradictory. So, I mean... You know, on the one hand, you've got, yeah, the sort of, you know, as you point out, the almost Adornian kind of absolute negativity line, you know. Yeah, it's a real movement that abolishes the state of things. Whatever the present state of things is, you just got to abolish it. I and mean, on the other hand, you have this sort of idea that, yeah, we could all just be doing whatever job, whenever, right? I mean, I kind of, I mean, the critical critics line, you know, the hunting in the morning, whatever it is, fishing in the morning, hunting in the evening, being a critical critic, at night, I don't know, is, you know, it's partly intended to be a joke. So, so it's got that sort of kind of caveat you can attach to it. But also, like, that's one image of abolishing the present state of things because, you know, the present state of things is the worker in factories have to do one single specialised task in a repetitive way and have no holistic understanding of how, you know, what they're doing relates you know, they have, they have no idea how, how their just that discrete task relates to the whole, which is one of the sort of reasons why the worker is alienated from their labour. If we go back to 1844, so the imaginary, the, the kind of the negative image of that almost is, you know, worker able to do various jobs that suits them throughout the day, not just within the same factory, but, you know, in different kind of areas of life. And yeah, that's, that would be one way, I suppose, of imagining abolishing the way that wage labour worked in, you know, the 1840s. So you just have these sort of like, you know, fragments of redemption, you know, again, if you think of the Adornian terms, you just got these little kind of like glimpses of redemption within the present state of things. But there's your utopia, kind of run with it as you want, but don't maybe took too much stock in the specifics. Yeah, I mean, I, it's kind of interesting because a lot of people are sort of talking about utopia these days, right? Especially, you know... Many people. Many. No, but I mean, it's kind of thing, I'm doing a thesis on it, right? It's like, you know... Yeah. Um, it probably uh, feels like more people are doing it, if you see <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, so, yeah but um, but and I it, and you know, I wonder what I don't know really where I'm going with it, but I sort of just it, it seems to me that if you know the even the idea of this present state of things, right? I sort of think maybe the point is the moment that you know what the present state of things is, first of all, you're going to want to abolish it, and the more yeah. that you know about the present state of things, you're going to know what it would be like to abolish it because the present state of things is the wage relation, right? You get rid of that and, you know, sort of part of the point, I guess, maybe is that, well, all the other stuff is going to follow from that. Once you work out that's what you're doing, you've got you've just got to you've just got to work from that principle, I guess. And maybe that's one way of viewing it. it. It might be problematic. I don't know. But um... Well, I think but like, yeah, I mean, it depends how we read the kind of, you know, historicized we want to get out with the term the present state of things, right? Do we mean the present state of things in 1840, in the 1840s? Do we mean the present state of things now? Or do we mean whatever present state of things, regardless of what they are? You know, I'm sort of... For, I suppose for Adorno-y reasons, I suppose I'm more, I'm most tempted to read it as it's the present state of things, whatever they are. We, can, you know, c- Communism would be a kind of system which gives people the autonomy to abolish whatever they think sucks right now, right? You know, it's un- it's unbelievably hybristic to think that if we abolish the way that things suck now, we're actually going to create like, a society that's lastingly going to not suck, right? Unless we give people the power 
So, so you need to change things once it starts obviously sucking, right? So, it, and, you know, and that's part of like what you, why, you know, what materialism needs to be, right? You know, we realize that we exist in a dynamic world. There's no, there's not, you know, there isn't necessarily going to be any permanently settled state in which we can go well this is the perfect society and this is going to last forever right we respond we live off the natural world the natural world is dynamic and does change and we change and we exist in this sort of relationship particular relationship with that it's contradictions because marx and engels also talk about the revolution is basically abolishing history and therefore kind of maybe getting us to that final set of state of things I don't think we ha- I don't think the most interesting thing we can say about the theory that they, Marx and Engels give us in the German ideology is that it's one which is kind of rigidly teleological and leads to an obvious final end point, right? I think if we read it in this sort of like Adornian negative way more, we end up getting, to my mind, we end up getting to getting kind of more interesting kind of theory out of it and a more interesting way of seeing history and seeing the interrelation of, of, of nature and history and the interrelation of the world and how we exist in it and politics and all those you know big things. So when it comes to you know the historical nature of this text in terms of the development of Marx and Engels' own you know, philosophical methodology, you get the bedrock of materialism here. But how much do you think sort of the critique of political economy would play in plays in this text? I mean, it's still very much uh, Alpha said called it very positivistic. It's really giving you the tools to get there. This is why it's so therapeutic in in quite an interesting way. And it's it's I quite, I quite like about it is it's not giving you Capital Volume One. It's giving you what you need to do to something like Capital Volume One becomes possible, which is why it's not it's inherently less scholastic. But I was wondering in terms of where this would fit in the trajectory of moving from we need materialism to we need a materialist critique of political economy. Mm. Like how economic is the critique of capitalism here in contrast to, say, like Capital Volume 1, you know, the Grundrisse, uh, yeah, all the rest. Yeah, I mean, well, I think, I personally, I think it's a prolegomena to a critique of political economy. So you're set, you're kind of, you're setting, you're making a bunch of philosophical claims that are then going to allow you to critique political economy in the way that Marx then wants to in his later writing. There is some of the argument is done through kind of what can seem like sort of arguments from political economy. You know, Marx takes you through the transition from feudalism to capitalism, for example. But, you know, they're very broad brush accounts and not that much is riding on the historical accuracy of the claims that Marx made. So in that sense, it is different, you know, it is very different to what's going on in Capital Volume 1. And, you know, you can see how the author of Capital wrote this thing and how he ultimately would have wanted to be writing something more like Capital. But he remained, you know, it's in the first instance a philosophical text and, yeah, as a kind of score settling of, Marx with his old philosophical self, it is a, a prolegomena to Marx's critique of political economy rather than constituting a substantial contribution to the critique of political mm-hmm. economy, in my view. Yeah, absolutely. And so I quite like about it overall is it's, I mean, in the introduction, you talk about how the, essentially it's uh, put in like Kantian terms, like a Copernican revolution. It's, you know, you flip the orientation, you make, it's uh, philosophical problems are at base problems of power, material relations. And so I do like this very Foucauldian almost kind of kind of marks we get here, doing like the analytic philosophy of politics, clarifying the rules of the game, the terms of order, yeah. uh, to put it in the terms of Sacred Robertson, and then okay, we can uh, let rip now. We've all we've cleaned ourselves out a little bit. We've had a philosophical or a, a post hegelian enema, so to speak, and <laughs> there we go. There, but yeah. I, think, I guess we'll probably wrap up a little bit. I mean, uh, will, will do you have any um, any uh, fi- final sort of questions? Oh, I don't know. I wanted to ask a question about the. 11th thesis on Feuerbach, right? The, the philosophers have only yeah. interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. And I was going to draw upon my favourite story, which is that Engels edited that line to add the word however. And I was wondering, because he so the original line that Marx writes says, as I said it, but then by adding the point however is to change it, you kind of set up this distinction between... Right, the yeah, yeah. And this, which means that like the most annoying people in the world can say things like, oh, well, what are you going to do in practice, right? There's a kind of mirroring of the, how yeah. are you going to pay for it, liberals, 
with the kind of how are you gonna class consciousness it mls you know and and i was sort of interested you know in maybe a glance towards this idea of philosophical therapy what is this work as you know even though there's a huge critique of philosophy what is this work as a critique of philosophy or as a work of philosophy rather right like obviously it's got stuff to say about what how we should think about politics how we should think about economics how we should think about freedom but i'm kind of interested in the relation between abolishing the present state of things and the point is to change it right those two and why you think that 11th thesis is kind of such a great summary of of this text so many questions i hope it makes yeah gosh i mean i love that story yeah and it is that's a nice it's a nice sort of i will be quoting that as a sort of riposte to kind of any kind of anti-adornians you think you know so you can't just do it on the round before no so what's you know what's for what do i want to take away from this i mean Gosh, it's a big, I mean, you know, why does anyone do anything? Like, you know, I want to make a kind of an interesting contribution to something that matters to me, which is how do I, you know, I don't know. I mean, like, I'm not a, I'm not a man who's ever going to seize the historical moment and, you know, do something spectacular. I'm not Lenin, right? I'll never be Lenin. You know, I'm, I, I like to read quietly by myself. So I want to make sense <laughs> How my overarching desire to read quietly by myself might kind of could ever possibly lead to some sort of positive contribution to the politics that I care about. I want to figure that out in a way that's not just flattering to the to myself and to my desire to read quietly by myself. So you know, I want to figure out what philosophy could you know how you know you know obviously I spend my time in academic departments and so on and so forth, and I spend a lot of my life in those departments at any rate. And I want to figure out how that world could, how what we do in that world could ever break out in a meaningful way into, you know, the kind of seismic change that you need not to salvage, you know, the species that we have, you know. And so, I mean, yeah, it's a philosophical text. It's a text aimed at philosophers and to kind of get us thinking about those questions in a way that kind of makes coherent sense and i think the value of the text is to do that groundwork it doesn't give you any particular answers and reading it in and of itself won't make you any better but it might help you in that kind of critical self-critical process towards you know yeah i mean purging yourself of various pretensions that can exist due to your due to one's desire to read quietly by oneself and or the other major academic drive to be the best boy or girl in the class you know you, you can you know you can you know whoever in the class you know but i'm imagining you were in the class you're, you're, you're schooled you know you're, you're whatever you're so you, you know what i mean like you kind of get too into like very technical kind of points in these particular thinkers you dedicate your life to and you become a world's most storied expert in that but what does it matter what does it mean i think the beginning to to puzzle that out yeah can this text can be a kind of contribution to to, to beginning to figure that out for oneself if that helps it makes sense no absolutely so just as a way of wrapping up everyone go buy the new abridgment of the german ideology from repeater books it's look That's as right. a guy who's like set himself for reading sterner for the next you know goddamn like three four years even i found this convincing like against like sterner like this is i'm not someone who's very good at giving marx and Engels their due but this text is probably one of the most intense forms of radicality i've read from marx and engels i think we need to go back to this text we must return with a capital v right there also go read go by infinitely full of hope i've read it like twice i do sort of make a tradition of it now i when any of my friends have kids the dad always gets a copy of <laughs> infinitely full of hope <laughs> and a bottle of something strong it's after you do kind of need something that hopeful at some point. It's also a really good book on teaching can as well. For fans of Profane Illuminations or other show on Zero Books, of course, a lot of hope, a lot of utopia going on there. People, you're going to love it. Tom, or let's many say, are talking about utopia, utopia these days. Many, pe- many people are talking about utopia because we see it nowhere and it is everywhere. <gasps> other we are nothing in it, we must be everywhere. <laughs> yeah. That's how you just do your thesis. You just say, many are talking about utopia. A lot of people too. Many, there's a spectre haunting. There's a lot of chat about you too few these days. Yeah. Come on, guys. There's a spectre <laughs> haunting. Jerry Seinfeld. Let's right. <laughs> yeah. deal with you too few. Okay, Tom, thank you so much for coming on to Convergences. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Cheers. 
We appreciate your support of the imprint and the channel. Subscribe to Zero Books today on Patreon. Your material support helps us to promote a variety of perspectives on the left. Also, discover the many titles, new and old, that Zero has curated. Navigate to any of the links in the show notes to extend your support.